let me go ahead and get started then. All right, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second lecture of the 2020 Saturday Physics for Everyone series sponsored by the Department of Physics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. My name is Patrick Snyder. I'm the coordinator for this series and also serve as the undergraduate coordinator for the department. Um, so the Saturday Physics for Everyone series is designed to give high schoolers and the general public the opportunity to hear from world-class scientists and researchers on the modern aspects of how physics, of physics and how physics relates to the broader world around us. So that being said, I'll put my email in the chat and if you're interested in becoming a student at Illinois or have any other questions about today's series, shoot it over to me or just put it in the chat and I'd be happy to help you with that. So let's see. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, and uh, there's a question about, I would like to share this with my high school students. Um, we'll um, be posting this in all, on all of our channels, YouTube and all of our social media and we welcome. Um, and you all should also be getting a link uh, for the live. Um, for the on-demand webinar recording. So, so each uh, little bit about the series. So each talk is scheduled roughly, roughly every other week in the fall. So the next one um, will actually be in four weeks. Um, so um, we're skipping uh, one session. Um, and it'll be presented at 11.15 instead of 10.15. And this is to kind of compensate for um, the presenter being in California. So it's by theoretical physicist, Professor P Professor Smitha Vishvishvara, who will present a talk entitled Cosmic Journeys and Quantum Voyages, Exploring Physics Through the Arts. So I really encourage all of you to invite all of your friends who are interested in, in the arts to attend this talk. And so after this talk, you'll all receive a short survey and I encourage all of you to fill that out. So all those that attended today or today, uh, the session two weeks ago, will receive an invitation for all future Saturday Physics series. And if you want, you can unsubscribe to that group uh, when you get that, if you, if you want. So let me give you a little breakdown of how today's event will go. First, I'll present Yoni Khan, faculty sponsor for the Saturday Physics for Everyone program. And he'll introduce today's speaker, Professor Brian Fields. Now today's session is scheduled to last until 1130 Central Time and will include a Q&A session throughout um, and at the end of the talk. Um, so questions will be taken uh, from attendees of today's session. So I encourage all of you to submit your questions uh, by the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I've also enabled um, the upvoting and commenting um, on questions uh, for this session. So I encourage all of you to be um, respectful in your use of those functions, right? So without further ado, let me present to you theoretical physicist and faculty sponsor of Saturday Physics for Everyone, Professor Yoni Khan. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Brian Fields, um, and this is my son who is so excited about the presentation that uh, he just had to go and watch it for himself. And so I hope I can introduce him to this series in person when, when this is all over. So uh, Professor Fields uh, is a particle astrophysicist. And so you study some of the biggest explosions and the highest energy particles in the universe. And you know, this is a particular interest to me because I study dark matter. And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out in the universe is, you know, where did the dark matter come from? Where is it going? You know, is it annihilating into other stuff that we can detect today? Um, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing Professor Fields talk about uh, all the way that stars are, uh, are attacking us and the interesting science that we can learn from them. Thanks. All righty then. Well, thank you, Yoni, and thank you, Patrick, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so it's a, I, I, I am impressed that you're here because, uh, uh, you know, it's a Saturday. Uh, it's yet another Zoom session, and it's yet more mayhem and calamity, you know, which we have already too much of in 2020. Um, and indeed, for even for this series, you know, it's yet another, uh, another talk about disasters. So, but I hope today to ease your mind. Uh, so although we are going to talk about what happens when stars attack, um, uh, this is not adding to the 2020 dumpster fire. We're going to kind of step back, look at the bigger picture, and the threat we're talking about is not a threat from today. So, spoiler alert, it, it, nothing to worry about today. Um, so, 
Indeed, my subject is when stars attack, and I don't mean uh, ill-behaved uh, Hollywood celebrities, I mean actual astronomical objects. In particular, uh, we'll be talking about what happens when supernova explosions happen near the Earth and how we can use radioactivity to, uh, to tell whether this has happened in the geological past. Um, all right, so there we go. Um, all right, so first, uh, so I very much would like you to ask questions all, all the way through. Don't just go ahead and uh, uh, don't wait for the end. And I'll even have little breaks for questions, but to, uh, to kind of help the participation go. Um, so, uh, so who saw the eclipse? I believe we've got a poll uh, that will pop up. Uh, so I'm interested in who saw the, uh, the beautiful eclipse in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, whoops. Oh, uh, we have two polls. So first, actually, we, let's do this poll too. So are you a student? Uh, so- Sorry about that, Brian. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Yeah, it's a good poll too. We can do that one. Um, and uh, um, I'm just interested in who's out there. Uh, and then after this, there's, there's, there'll be a question about the eclipse too. So on top of everything, you begin with a quiz. Sorry about that. All right, that's I probably think, yeah. it. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, all right. So let's see. And okay, great. And then, did you see the eclipse? And the answer is yes. And you were in totality, where it was awesome. And if you're in totality, the only answer is that it was awesome. And either you're outside of totality and you saw it, it was great. Outside of totality, it's overrated. And then, what's this about an eclipse? So. Uh, All right, so that's probably enough, right? All right, do we, do we see the statistics on that? So how many, Patrick, can you see? Yeah. Oh, great, and tons of people were in totality. That's fantastic. All right, and uh, I had the great privilege to be in totality as well. The astronomy department at Illinois, we had a big, uh, a big party at the place where the, in Goreville in Southern Illinois, where the eclipse lasted the longest. It was phenomenal, and one of the, uh, the messages from the eclipse, it was so amazing. And one of the messages of the eclipse is that, um, uh, is to remind us that we aren't just citizens of our little town or our state or our country or even the world, that we're citizens of the cosmos. That is events, we, we, we're part of a larger universe and once in a while, events in the larger universe have an impact on us. And the eclipse is kind of a gentle reminder of that. But this theme that we are citizens of the cosmos, we participate in the life of the cosmos, that will be one of the themes of this talk. All right, so again, we're gonna talk about what happens when stars attack, and here's the game plan. So first, we're interested in supernovae, so let me tell you about what supernovae are like, what they look like to human beings who have seen them with their naked eyes, uh, and, uh, they're, they're, and how they work. And these things are brighter than a billion suns, as we'll see. Uh, then we'll bring the problem closer to home. Uh, so what happens if supernova explosions don't occur far away, as most of them do, but what happens if one blows up near the Earth? And, uh, and it turns out that would be bad, and we'll talk about the ways that would be bad. Uh, and then the question is, how would we know? If this happened in the geological past, how would we know that there was a supernova that blew up near the Earth millions of years ago? And so what we want to do is supernova archaeology. And, uh, and it turns out what we want to do, as, as I'll explain, is look for debris from the explosion at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and amazingly, this has happened and we have evidence this has occurred. So this is, this is real. Uh, and then once we realize that we can detect uh, supernovae from a few million years ago, as I will show you, we can, then that raises the question about what if we had a supernova even closer, but uh, in the deeper geological past, and could there be a supernova close enough to be dangerous? And I'm going to suggest, indeed, that may have been the case, uh, and that supernova explosions might have been responsible for extinctions that occurred, biological extinctions that occurred on Earth about 360 million years ago. Okay. 
So that's the plan. And first step, though, is uh, before we get to all this mayhem, we got to talk about what a supernova is in the first place. So let's talk about supernova explosion. So this is one of these gorgeous images, which I will explain. All right. So a supernova marks the death of a star. Um, so if we're going to talk about supernovae, we need to understand stars. We need to understand stars from a physics point of view. Um, and so, uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's do a little bit of physics, but it's Saturday morning. So we'll start by me uh, reminding you of things you already know. Um, it's Saturday, you're waking up. So, uh, so stars, like the sun in this picture here, constantly lose energy. So as you know, we can collect power from the sun, solar power, we collect energy that's coming off of the sun in the form of light. Uh, and that means the sun is generating this light and, uh, uh, and throws it out into space. And so in that sense, uh, stars are constantly, you know, creating, you know, taking energy in the form of light and radiating it out to the universe and losing it from themselves. I know you already knew that, uh, but I'm going someplace with this. Second, stars like the sun here have a finite mass. Now they have a large amount of mass. Finite doesn't mean it can't be large. It just means not infinite. So stars have a not infinite amount of mass. And that means whatever their fuel supply is, doesn't matter what it is, but whatever it is, their fuel supply is finite, not infinite, which means their energy supply, whatever it is they use to generate all this wonderful solar energy, uh, that is limited, okay? And then finally, a very important thing physics teaches us is that energy is conserved. So you can uh, take energy and uh, change it from one form to the other, uh, move it from one place to the other, but you can't make energy out of nothing. Uh, this is often uh, stated in the famous theorem, there is no free lunch. Okay, so none of these three facts are particularly surprising. Uh, you know all of this, you knew it before we started the talk. But if you put them all together, that's the fun part, you reach an interesting conclusion. So this is now your turn. So put those together. And what do you find? Uh, I'm looking in the chat. If it's in the other window, I'll need help. Go ahead, don't be shy. There we go, very nice. Uh, so, uh, so George, uh, nicely points out that this means stars will burn out. Stars can't live forever because they're losing energy. They only have a finite supply. They can't make more, which means sooner or later it's going to be used up that they, uh, they can't live forever. And since stars, including the sun, can't live forever, this means that stars, well, it's sort of George already said it, stars must die. Um, so I've already now bummed you out even more. There's an important follow-up, I should say, uh, that uh, although stars, there we go, and Mitch uh, said it as well, stars must die. There's an important follow-up question, how long do stars live? And they live a very long time. We'll get to that. They live a very long time. So again, don't, this is not a problem for, for us to worry about in 2020, but eventually stars do die. But there's another thing I want to point out. Stars do not live forever. They must die after some amount of time, millions or even billions of years, but they must die. And yet, stars are around today. You look in the, you look in the daytime sky, you see the sun. You look at the nighttime sky, you see many stars. And so uh, they don't live forever, and yet we see them in the sky. So that tells us something else. Now it's your turn. They have to be born, bless you. Thank you, Mitch. They have to be born. Um, and so, uh, so stars not only die, but because they live a finite amount of time, we see some in the sky, they can't have been here forever. They had to have been born at some point. And so, uh, so the, the lesson we take from this then is that stars have life cycles. They're born, they live their lives and die. So like uh, people in dogs, they have life cycles. Um, and that is one of the most profound facts in astronomy. And all of that comes from these three simple facts. So that's a beautiful example of sort of how astrophysics work. You take a little bit of facts and some imagination and look where you can go with it. So we get that stars have life cycles. And so let's... Uh, Brian, I think you muted yourself. Sorry about that. There we go. So, so this is the great circle, the circle of life. Uh, so, uh, our galaxy contains gas, 
uh, that's uh, between the stars. So that's this gorgeous picture here. Uh, and this gas can condense uh, into these clouds called molecular clouds. And, uh, and some of the material in this molecular clouds uh, is, is held together by its own gravity and collapses upon itself and eventually ignites and forms a star. Uh, and those stars live their lives and then eventually die. This is a case of a star that actually dies as a supernova, leaves behind some crunchy center, uh, uh, some, some remnant, but most of the star is blown back into the universe uh, uh, in, uh, in the form of very hot gas, mixes with the other gas that's there, and new generations of stars are born. So this is the circle of life. Uh, so this is the, the life cycle of stars, and we observe uh, all of the phases of this life cycle. All right. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a life cycle of all stars, but now I want to focus on the most massive stars, eight or ten times the mass of the sun, and those are unusual stars, but very spectacular. Uh, and they're spectacular because they die as supernova explosions, and that'll be our main, um, uh, that'll be our main topic of discussion today. Um, so, uh, um, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, let's see, a couple of questions uh, before I go any further. If an asteroid f falls in the sun, oh yeah, we actually see comets form in the sun and then the sun just eats them. Yeah, and then they eventually, you know, become part of the sun. Oh, and black holes, we won't say much about black holes, but, uh, but the way, one way to make a black hole is uh, that's, that's a possible outcome of a supernova explosion. So that's a consequence of what we'll be talking about today. Great. So let's talk about supernova explosions. So supernova explosions are the spectacular deaths of stars, and I'm particularly interested in massive stars, more than 10 times the mass of the sun. Um, and so this gorgeous image here, uh, there are two things that draw your eye. Uh, and so one of the things is this, uh, this, uh, this sort of smudge of light here. Uh, this is a galaxy. It's a disk of stars, and we're seeing it kind of, you know, almost edge on. Um, and, uh, and all the fuzzy light here, uh, it looks like gas, but it's actually not. These are stars. The, almost all of that light is due to stars, but there's so many that even this image from the Hubble telescope can't make them out individually. They all smear together in the image. And you're seeing the combined light here of something like 100 billion stars. Um, so that's the sort of a typical galaxy like our own. But the other thing you see is out in the outskirts of this galaxy, uh, you see this. And that is the light from one exploding star that was seen in, uh, uh, in 1994, uh, and that is a supernova explosion. Um, and, so, uh, and so one of the messages you get from this, if you sort of squint and sort of ask yourself, how does the total amount of light from all the stars in the galaxy compare to the supernova, and they're sort of comparable to each other. And so what that tells you is, uh, at their brightest, a supernova can be as bright as 100 billion suns. So these are enormously bright, very, very powerful objects. Okay. Uh, so that, so, but the explosions that aren't as bright uh, uh, like this all the time, they, they explode after a few weeks, they reach maximum brightness and then they dim, but then they launch a blast wave uh, uh, of most of the mass of the star is flung out into interstellar space, sweeps up interstellar space and makes an enormous bubble. And if you wait till thousands of years later, we can see bubbles. Now, this isn't from the supernova I just showed you. This is from something that happened much earlier in our own galaxy. Uh, and this bubble here is the remains of a supernova explosion that's thousands of years old, in fact, tens of thousands of years old. And to give you a sense of scale, the size of this bubble is in the ballpark of 300 light years. So that's how, that's not, that's a distance, not a time. It's how far light goes in uh, 300 years. And to give you an idea, the nearest star to us is about four light years. And the typical spacing between stars in our galaxy is about three light years. So this thing is about 100 times the spacing between neighboring stars. So this is a gigantic region swept out by, uh, by one supernova. So all the gas in that region has been swept out and made into a bubble from a supernova explosion tens of thousands of years ago. So these are tremendously powerful, spectacular events. All right, uh, good. So 
Another thing we'll need for our talk uh, that later on will be important is supernovae do many interesting things. Uh, and one of the things they do, and uh, this is why Yoni and I both love them, is that supernovae are particle accelerators. They create these high energy particles, which we call cosmic rays. Um, and so, uh, and the way we know this is, so here is another example of a bubble left behind by a supernova about a thousand years ago. So this is supernova 1006. So they, this explosion was seen by people in the year 1006. Uh, and now it's left to this enormous bubble, uh, which we see in ordinary light, as well as it, it's, it emits X-rays and it emits radio waves. And this picture includes all of those features. But then if we look at it, with telescopes that are capable of seeing very high energy uh, radiation, these gamma rays, uh, then the same image when seen in gamma rays, we see that the supernova is emitting gamma rays. And the reason it's emitting gamma rays for the expert, these are TEV gamma rays, they're very impressive. Uh, then uh, what these are is these are from cosmic rays, high energy particles that were accelerated by the supernova blast. They're slamming into the gas that's part of the blast uh, and creating these gamma rays. So supernovae accelerate high energy particles which then irradiate everything around them. And we will, uh, um, uh, then we will uh, we'll be interested in that as well. All right, so, uh, yeah, so, that, so like CERN and Fermi, exactly right, exactly right. So, uh, so at, uh, in laboratories on Earth, we do the particle acceleration in a controlled way with these big accelerators in Fermilab and in Europe at CERN. Uh, but the, the universe knows how to do this as well on an even grander scale. And in fact, supernovae can accelerate particles to higher energies than we can even attain in the lab. That's one of the beautiful things about them. Uh, they're incredibly powerful things. All right. So now, these supernova explosions, um, they don't happen very often. We get maybe one, two, three a century in our whole galaxy, somewhere in our whole galaxy, only one or two or three per century. So they're quite rare. Uh, but, uh, but still, human beings have been around enough and even writing things down long enough that there are people that have the great privilege of seeing supernovae in our own galaxy with their naked eye. Uh, and uh, the, I could give a whole talk on that, but let's just talk about a few examples. In the year 1054, uh, there was an amazing light in the sky. Uh, oddly, in Europe, there was no record of this. That's a little peculiar. People still wonder why that is. But in China, uh, there's a beautiful record of it. There, there was Chinese uh, sort of imperial astronomers, and they called this thing a guest star. Uh, I don't read Chinese, but I'm, I'm told that this is, uh, this is their, their record of the event, and this is their term, guest star. In fact, I think it even says the constellation that the guest star lived in, which turns out to be Taurus, the bull. Um, and they, they documented where it was in the sky and in which constellation. Very good. They were very good astronomers. Um, and uh, uh, it wasn't just seen in China. Uh, it likely was recorded by uh, the uh, Native Americans in the southwest of the U.S. In, the, in, in New Mexico, there's a place called Chaco, the Chaco Canyon, where the Anasazi people live, who are great astronomers. And there's this rock painting where there's a full moon, a star-like thing in a hand. And I'm no anthropologist, but my understanding is the hand means this is something significant. And from the Chinese records, we know there should have been a full moon near the explosion. So we believe this is also the same, uh, the same thing that the Chinese as a guest star. So that was, uh, that's what human beings saw in the year 1054. And the question is, what does it look like now? If we look at the same direction of the sky, what do we see? And this is what we see. So this is a thing that's called the Crab Nebula, because you kind of squint your eyes, it looks like a crab. And this is the, what the explosion looks like now, almost a thousand years later. Um, and so what you can see is there's this object in the center, which you're seeing as an image in x-rays there, that's emitting x-rays. In fact, it's spinning around. It's the, it's the ultra-dense corpse of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the core of the star. It's called a neutron star. And it's spinning around really fast, which means that we call it a pulsar. Um, and it's uh, energizing the medium around it. And so the rest of this image was taken, the sort of purple stuff was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's creating high energy particles and it's energizing the re region around it. So this is, uh, this is what happens uh, a thousand years later after this explosion. Okay, 
Uh, so one other example of uh, recorded history a little later where we have even better records uh, was uh, this. From 1572, the great uh, uh, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe uh, uh, made, uh, made beautiful records of this thing that he called a new star, a nova stellar, as he said in Latin. Uh, and you can see this diagram here, this is in the constellation Cassiopeia, and then uh, the little, the brightest thing there, he labeled I, that's this thing he calls a nova stella, a new star. Um, and if we look, same thing, if we look in that same region of the sky today with X-ray vision, this is what we see. Uh, so this again is the remains of a supernova explosion, that's this bubble that's been blown in the uh, 400 odd years since. Um, and it's crackling with x-rays, which, uh, which is nature's way of telling us it's really hot. It's still really, really hot, millions of degrees, even hundreds of years later. Um, and one of the great things is that Tycho, so there he is, he was a sort of a nobleman, so you can see he's got his, all uh, his garb on, uh, and he beautifully documented what he saw. Um, and so this is like a firsthand account of a supernova explosion. And so I particularly love this, uh, so, uh, so what I will do is I'll do a little dramatic reading and sort of pay attention uh, and uh, to get what it's like to actually see this with your own eyes. And so he says, on the 11th day of November in the evening after sunset, I noticed that a new and unusual star surpassing the other stars in brilliancy was shining. And since I had from boyhood known all of the stars of the heavens perfectly, it was quite evident to me that there had never been any star in that place of the sky. I was so astonished of this sight, a miracle indeed, one that had never been previously be seen before our time in any age since the beginning of the world. So I love that. Uh, and why I love it is Tycho was an amazing astronomer and it's so wonderful that he recorded this for us. And I love it because he got a lot of things right, but even great scientists make mistakes, he got some things wrong. So let's give him credit first though. What did Tycho get right? So maybe use the chat. So he got a bunch of things right, so let's give him his props for that. Previously unseen star, very good. There, there, there was not a star, there had not been a star seen, at least with the naked eye before, very good. Other things? It was definitely bright, he's totally right. <laughs> Absolutely, very good, very good, very good. Uh, and I think that's about it. anything else. Uh, that's very good. So let me, so let's give him his props. It was definitely unusual. Very good. And took the time to make the record. Very good. And definitely brilliant. Oh, and he also had known all the stars of the heavens perfectly. He wasn't a modest man, but he was a fantastic astronomer. He really did know the sky very well. So he's just being honest, although not particularly modest. Now, that said, uh, Tycho did make some mistakes. So he says things that are wrong that we now know are wrong. Um, so what are some things he got wrong? Yeah, not the first, very good. Uh, never been any star there. Yeah, that's right, good, good. Uh, and there's, there's one other thing. It depends on how tough a grader you are. There's something else he gets wrong. Yeah, in fact, it was already said, yeah. yeah it wasn't new, yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, it's, it is very romantic, I completely agree. He said it was new, uh, right. Um, uh, uh, he said it, there was a new star and there had never been any star in that place of the sky. And it depends on how tough a grader, because to your naked eye, there had not been one. So actually to, to you know, it's fair enough. Uh, but we now know it wasn't actually a new star. It was something, there had, something that had been there, uh, but then went away. So it was a change in the number of stars, but it wasn't an increase, it was a decrease. So that's what we in physics call a sign error. And I make sign errors all the time, so I'm not gonna grade too tough on that. And he said this has never been previously seen before our time since the beginning of the era. That's just arrogant. He has no way of knowing that. And I just showed you uh, 500 years before people had seen this beautiful uh, crab nebula. So. Uh, so that's a first-hand account of a supernova explosion. So I wanna just tell you a little bit about how supernovae work. Um, so these are massive stars, like I said, eight, 10 times the mass of the sun, and they are the James Dean of stars. And the younger people might not know who James Dean is. What you need to know is he's a Hollywood guy, and he lived fast, died young, and left a beautiful corpse. And that's what these stars do. These massive stars live fast. Um, so like all stars, these, these, these are 10 times the mass of the sun, so they're enormously massive. And so that means they have a lot of gravity, and that means their gravity they pull on their cells. And so the life of all stars is a struggle against their own gravity. And the way they struggle against their gravity is 
uh, whoops, is they keep themselves hot. Um, so stars, the sun and all other stars generate a lot of heat in their core and that heat keeps them nice and pressurized. So it's sort of like the same way a, a car tire holds up a car because it's pressurized. The heat at the core of the star uh, keeps it nice. The gas pressure keeps it pressurized and it can fight against its own gravity. And the way it generates that heat is through nuclear reactions. It's so hot that it undergoes nuclear reactions at the core of the star, fusion reactions. Um, uh, but when the fuel runs out, when it, when it undergoes uh, fusion reactions to the point where uh, it can't fuse anything more, then the fuel runs out and the star then dies and dies young. If it's a massive star, they don't live very long. They, uh, they have a lot of mass, but they burn so violently that they have a much shorter lifetime than something like the sun. They only live for a few million years as opposed to the sun, which lives billions of years. And then when they die, uh, their fuel is burnt up, so then they can't fight against gravity and they collapse upon themselves. They implode. Uh, and then finally, they implode enough that the core of the star is crushed to incredibly high density. And in fact, it has the density of an atomic nucleus. And finally, it becomes rigid enough to fight against its own gravity. And then the overlying layers that are still gas slam down onto the core, bounce back and explode. Um, and then a shock wave is launched and we have an explosion. Um, and sadly, if we were in the lecture hall, I would then show you a demo involving a thing called an astro blaster. So when COVID is over, we'll go back and do all of this. Um, so start these supernovae, these massive stars live fast, die young, and then they leave a beautiful corpse. We've seen some example of that. The, there's an ultra dense cinder, which is a neutron star, or it can sometimes go be a black hole. So this is one way black holes can be formed. Um, uh, and um, but most of the mass of the star, 90% of the mass of the star is thrown out into space at high speed. And we've already seen examples of this. So this is a star that died about 300 years ago. And this actually is an X-ray image. So it's crackling with X-rays. Uh, and that's telling you that it's still incredibly hot uh, even uh, 300 years later. And there's a little dot at the center and that's the neutron star. Um, and then, yeah, so there we go. It's million degree gas. And then this is a piece of one of the bubbles left from a supernova more than 5,000 years ago. So that's part of the beautiful corpse. Okay, so one last thing you need to know about supernovae uh, is that they are element factories. So as I said, the stars keep themselves pressurized and hot by undergoing nuclear reactions. And these nuclear reactions start with the raw material of stars, which is hydrogen, then burn it to helium, then burn it to oxygen and carbon, and then neon, magnesium, silicon and sulfur all the way up to iron. And so they make heavier and heavier elements uh, deeper into the core of the star. It's a whole talk by itself. But then the star blows up and all of those wonderful new elements are ejected into space. So stars do this amazing uh, uh, alchemy. They change hydrogen to heavier elements through nuclear reactions and then throw that material into space. And we know this, this isn't just some, some theoretical dream. We know this is true, whoops. Sorry, uh, a little zoom incompetence there. Boom, and we know this is true, there we go. Because when we look at, so this is, these are, then this is an image taken with x-rays by looking very carefully at the light coming out from the remnants of this supernova, it's, it's tagged, it has these, it has these barcodes uh, the, the light has very uh, specific lines according to the different elements. So we can tease out which elements are present and we can see there's large amount in this explosion 300 years ago, large amounts of iron, lots of silicon and magnesium, just like you would expect. And interestingly, this star has some radioactive titanium. Uh, and so what's going on is in the blizzard of nuclear reactions in the star, most of what's made are ordinary elements, which are perfectly stable and we are made of them. We have iron in our blood, there's silicon in your computer batteries, magnesium you eat. Uh, but the, these nuclear reactions also make radioactive, unstable nuclei. And this is a particular kind of radioactivity, which is an unstable form of titanium that only lives for less than, a, it lives for about a hundred years and then emits flashes of light when it decays and we can still see those decays. So we can see uh, that, uh, that these, the star produce new elements, including radioactive elements. And we will be interested in that. Oh yeah, this is spectroscopy. For those who are familiar, this is exactly right. This is spectroscopy. Okay, all right. 
Uh, so now, once again, we get the circle of life, gas goes into stars, which then are live and die, and if they're supernovae, they die spectacularly in explosions, and then leave behind a neutron star or a black hole, and their new elements are then mixed back into the rest of the gas, and it cycles around and around, and more and more heavy elements are made over time. Uh, and so, and lo and behold, we are made of them. So the iron in our blood, the oxygen we are breathing came out of the explosion of supernovae that lived and died before the sun was even formed. So we are made of the ashes of stars. And so that's an amazing thing. Supernovae were necessary for our lives. We are the children of supernovae. All right, uh, so with that, uh, that was a lot. So we already had lots of questions, uh, uh, other, uh, other questions? Uh... Yeah, so we have a question in the, several questions in the chat and two hands raised. So if we want to just maybe, so Sandy asked, are more stars dying than being born or are more stars being born than dying? What a great question. Um, so um, what a great question. So in our galaxy today, uh, that is such a good question. Uh, and it's actually not so easy to answer um, So, uh, with any accuracy. So in, in our galaxy today, it's sort, of, uh, um, it's sort of about equal. There's about even, you know, there's, we, uh, our galaxy today, uh, uh, a star is born, you know, about once a year throughout an entire galaxy on average. Um, and stars die um, at a similar rate in our galaxy. Maybe not exactly the same, but similar. Most of them do not die as supernovae, by the way. Supernovae are quite rare. Most do not die as supernovae. Uh, th those, are, those are the unusual ones. But uh, in our universe as a whole, we do know that over the history of cosmic time, uh, there was actually much more star formation in the past and, uh, and it's been gradually trailing off. So, uh, so the, the peak star formation in our universe was billions of years ago. So it's starting to trail off, actually. So sorry, I'm going to bum you out. But, uh, but uh, in the universe as a whole, there are more stars that are dying than are being born today. But still, the, we still have a lot to go. There's still plenty of new stars to be formed. But the, but the, but the trend is going down. That's a great question. OK, great. Um, so the next one is, will the universe ultimately use up the hydrogen and die? Yeah, so that also is a fantastic question. Um, and so, uh, and so the, uh, so, uh, uh, and some of that we don't really know. Um, so within uh, the hydrogen that's within galaxies, and as, as, uh, as we said, that's the raw material for stars. So more and more of that will get converted into stars until basically it's, uh, uh, it's all been converted into stars or is so, uh, uh, is so hot and, and, uh, and diffuse that it can't condense anymore to make more stars. In fact, we have galaxies like that. They're called elliptical galaxies, where they're just big balls of stars, and they don't have any more cold gas, and they've converted all their gas into stars. And so that's it. They're done. Um, and so our galaxy is not like that. We still have gas in our galaxy. There's ongoing star formation. But eventually, our own galaxy will, will eventually consume all of its gas. That's right. And then, and then that's it. There will be no more, uh, no more star formation. So you know, enjoy the night sky when you can, because it will not last forever. And billions of years, though. So by the way, so again, not trying to add to 2020 misery. Yeah. All right? All right. And then um, it, do we have any more time for another question? So, yeah. so Jessica, Jessica actually um, has her hand up um, if you want to Jessica. Un unmute, Jessica. Sorry, that was an accident. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, cool, you. yeah. <laughs> so Guy, um, if you uh, wanna, wanna chat. Uh, no, sorry. No okay. Mistake. All right. Cool. <laughs> no problem. Glad you're here. Okay. Uh, all right. So tell you what then, why don't we move on? Uh, you're like, oh, the other, the other parts won't take as long as this. You're probably panicking. Don't worry. Uh, you just needed, I needed to tell you those things for you to get the rest of the joke. So here we go. So now that you know a lot about supernovae, now let's bring the problem closer to home. What if one of these things occurs near the earth? Um, so this is a beautiful image of a star that exploded relatively nearby, but not even in our own Milky Way galaxy. This was sort of in the, the backyard neighbor baby galaxy. Uh, so it's a pretty picture, but that's not what I mean by nearby. I mean much closer than this. Um, so what, what happens if we have supernova explosions near the Earth? Well, 
there's no getting around this. They are cosmic weapons of mass disruption, WMD. And as you know, in these sad days, WMD are nothing to joke about, but it's really the only scale for comparison. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, um, in our Milky Way galaxy, uh, we only have one, two, maybe three supernovae a century on average anywhere in our entire galaxy. And I've shown you a beautiful Hubble picture here of a, not our galaxy, because we live in our galaxy, uh, but in, uh, and so I can't show you a, a bird's eye view of it. We don't have a bird's eye view. This is a galaxy similar to ours called M51, um, and it has be beautiful spiral arms like we do. So, uh, um, uh, and that's, that's sort of, you know, uh, gives you an idea of what our galaxy would be like. Um, and it's much, and it's, and it's enormous. It's, you know, uh, 100,000 uh, light years from side to side. Um, and in that entire galaxy, you might have a few supernovae a century. And they're spread throughout the whole galaxy, so most occur very far away. So they're spectacular but harmless. In fact, some can be so far away, uh, and they could be obscured, so we don't even see them with our naked eye. Um, so, and I'm happy to tell you that the things that make supernovae massive stars, they're very easy to find because they put out enormous amounts of light before they die. Uh, so they're the brightest things in the sky and we know there are none near us. So sleep well tonight. There are many things to worry about in 2020, but this is a, a supernova is not one of them. But over the four and a half billion year history of the earth, it's very likely that we had supernovae blowing up near us. And so if we think about our ancestors or our descendants, then it's a real question, what happens if a supernova blows up near the Earth? And so let's talk about that. Well, the Surgeon General has indeed said that supernovae can, are a biohazard. They can be a, a, a risk to your health. And let's talk about why. Um, so if a supernova is too close, they can cause actual biological damage. They can harm the Earth's biosphere. And so the holy grail or maybe unholy grail of this field is to connect a mass extinction, a big die off of species on earth to a supernova. And we'll definitely say more about that. So, so you could ask yourself, what's the, what are the ill effects of cosmic WMD? Let me just, uh, uh, let me just move it along so I'll, uh, I, I won't make you guess. So there's two pieces. So one is to directly damage our uh, uh, life uh, uh, by high energy particles. Because remember, I told you, supernovae love to accelerate and create high energy particles that then irradiate everything around them. And we see this happening. We know it happens. And it turns out what, the, what, these, co what these cosmic ray particles do is they slam into the atmosphere of the Earth and collide with uh, 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 the atoms and the nuclei in the atmosphere of the Earth. So the cosmic rays don't actually directly hit us here on the surface, but they create other high energy particles for the experts they're called muons, which come all the way down to the ground and go deep into the ground. Um, and those can be very damaging. They can damage DNA. They can, they're, they're radiation. They're bad for you. But there's another thing that's a little less obvious that a supernova does that's at least as damaging. And that is the supernova's radiation, the cosmic rays, but also x-rays, uh, ultraviolet radiation, gamma rays, damage the atmosphere of the Earth. Once again, these high energy particles are stopped by the atmosphere, but the atmosphere is damaged grievously and they destroy the ozone uh, that's in the upper atmosphere. Um, and if we destroy the ozone, that's a bad thing. Uh, so why is it bad for us to remove the ozone from the upper atmosphere? So what, why do we need the ozone to be there? We critters that live on the surface of the Earth are grateful for ozone. And what's it good for? Yeah, that's right. It sh the ozone shields the, the Earth, the surface of the Earth, from ultraviolet light from the sun. So the sun that doesn't just emit nice visible light that lets us see the day. It also emits nasty ultraviolet light that's damaging to critters like us. Um, but the supernova wipes off the ozone layer. So that's bad. Uh, and then the sun's, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a little ozone hole like we had from spray cans. I mean wiping off the ozone layer. And then the sun's ultraviolet is unfiltered. So you and I would put on a hat and our sunblock and get on with our lives as best we could. But small plants and uh, uh, phytoplankton can't do anything about that. Uh, and they just get killed and they live at the bottom of the food chain. And then uh, the things that eat them die off and it's bad for everything. So that's the idea. Uh, so all of those things make supernovae dangerous if they're close enough that this damage is severe. 
and you can work out, oh uh, yeah, there we go, and you can work out about how far away you need to be for this to be safe, and the minimum safe distance is about 30 light years. And again, that's about 10 times the distance to nearby stars. So, so this is very close. This is not like, you know, it's not, a supernova doesn't threaten our whole, ga whole galaxy, just the region right around it. Um, and again, we don't have any threatening stars anywhere close to that distance. So for today, don't worry about it, but ancestors and descendants should worry about it. Okay. Um, all right. So far, so good. Okay. So I'll go ahead and keep going, but don't be shy about asking questions. So now we've talked about how powerful supernovae are. What happens if they get too close? Now the question is, if supernovae are really threatening, uh, if they're close, can we, can we tell after the fact? Can we see evidence of a nearby supernova? Um, are we okay, Patrick? Was there a question? Um, we could, we could uh, leave these questions until... Okay, great. Then, then let's press on and let's talk about how we would actually tell if there was a supernova near the Earth. So I like to call it supernova archaeology and this beautiful uh, uh, accelerator is part of the story. You'll see why. Um, okay. So if a supernova blows up near the Earth, it will literally rain its ejecta, its debris, the stuff that came out of the explosion will literally rain upon the Earth. Uh, and so this is sort of a schematic idea of how this works. Here's a beautiful image of a supernova uh, remnant, the remains of a supernova explosion. Uh, and these, and the, the, the material from the explosion is launched out going a few percent of the speed of light. It's amazing. And this debris plows through interstellar matter and sweeps it out, making these big bubbles we've been looking at. And if it's near the Earth, this thing will slam into the solar system. And then the only thing protecting us is actually the sun. Now the sun's the good guy because this is an image of the sun, in fact, a movie of the sun. And if I play it, you can see that the sun is blowing off this wind. What we're doing is we're covering up the actual glare of the sun itself. The circle is where the sun would be if we didn't cover it up. So you can see the region around it, the sun is blowing this wind of material. It's something you saw if you saw the, during the eclipse, that's what you can see. Um, and so, uh, so this solar wind is flowing outwards, the supernova comes inwards and the two winds collide. And so that means if the blast is close enough, it's so powerful that it can push this, uh, the solar wind back to the inner solar system. And then the supernova debris will rain onto the earth, literally fall from the sky as rain, tiny, tiny microscopic uh, particles. And then it'll accumulate all over the earth, but I'm particularly interested in the deep ocean. And to give you a sense of what that's like, this is a, this is a, a, a simulation uh, where, whoops, uh, so here's the sun. So this is a simulation of just, I'm zooming into the solar system. Here's the sun. A circle here is at the Earth's distance around the sun. And then I'm going to send a blast from below. It's like Jaws. I'm going to blast us with a supernova that comes from below. Uh, and, oh no, the movie didn't run. Okay. So what that should show you is it, the, it, it, uh, it, it gets deeply into the solar system. So, uh, so, okay, so then how would we know? The supernova rains its debris upon the Earth. How do we know after the fact that this has happened? If it's millions of years ago, somebody didn't see it and leave a record, but we just have the geology and the geological record to look at. So how would we know? So what we want to do is look for a fingerprint where we can dig up stuff from the bottom of the ocean or in the in the ancient fossils and say, yes, that was a supernova. So we need a signature where we know if we find it, it came from a supernova. And so, you already saw the supernovae are nuclear reactors, so let's look for a nuclear signature. So remember, a supernova makes the elements we're made of. It makes oxygen, iron, silicon. Uh, well, the Earth contains oxygen, iron, and silicon. That's great, but that didn't come from a supernova nearby recently. The Earth was born with those, so, so that just confuses the matter. So that's not, that's not a good way to tell that we had a recent supernova. But remember, I told you, supernovae also make uh, various kinds of radioactivity, radioactive isotopes. Um, and so, uh, and these, these different kinds of radioactivity live for different amounts of time. I showed you an example that would happen to be a radioactive form of titanium, and that lives for a few hundred years. But there are other kinds of radioactivity that lives, live for millions of years. And so now the game is, there are some things that are radioactive and they live for millions of years. If we can find those on the bottom of the ocean, and they're still there, they haven't changed, 
then we've got something. And the idea here is, it gets to what radioactivity is. A radioactive atom has a nucleus at the center with all its protons and neutrons that's unstable. It's not happy. It's not, it's not where it wants to be. It's not in its ground state. And so, like everybody else, if you're in an unstable situation, you make a change. And so a radioactive nucleus will then change, transform to a different kind of nucleus, a different kind of atom, a different kind of element that's more stable, and then it's, and then it's happy. Um, but it takes some time, and that amount of time, that half-life is what we're interested in. And there are some that live for millions of years. So what I want to do is find radioactive isotopes that live for millions of years, but they haven't decayed yet. Um, and so those are like green bananas, because like radioactivity, bananas change over time. They decay. They start green and eventually rot. Um, and so if you find a green banana in Illinois, you know, first of all, it was made recently. It hasn't decayed yet. And second, you know, it didn't come from here, so something had to bring it here. It's the same with our radioactive isotopes. If we can find radioactivity on the bottom of the ocean, uh, then we know it didn't get made on Earth. Earth doesn't naturally make radioactivity. And that means that it had to be made recently. It's a green banana, it had to be made recently, and it had to be brought here. So that's how we'll know that there was a recent supernova, a nearby supernova. Um, and it turns out the particular kind of radioactivity we will like the most is iron 60. It's a particular radioactive form of iron that uh, has a half-life of 2.6 million years. So it lives for a few million years and then dies. And it turns out for the experts, there are other kinds of radioactivity we could hope to look for, but I particularly care about this iron 60. Okay, so, uh, so, so we had this idea a long time ago, and then some people actually went out and tested it. And the way they tested it is they looked at this crazy thing called a deep ocean crust. So let me tell you about it. Um, so this thing uh, is something that you find on the bottom of the ocean, if you're clever. Uh, I didn't find it, other people did. It's called a ferromanganese crust. So these things live on the bottom of the ocean. And what they do is there's a rock uh, and then these particular rocks love to grab iron and manganese atoms from the water and they, and they attach to the rock. So then this, this, these layers of iron and manganese, and there's some other atoms too, but it's mostly iron and manganese, grow over time. So it's like tree rings. So this crust grows and it grows incredibly slowly, a millimeter per million years. And this picture here of this rock, uh, the thing that's, uh, the circle is a coin that's about that big. Uh, it's like a half dollar. So the rock, you know, you could fit it into your hand. Um, but that means it's many millimeters thick, and so it's going back many millions of years. Um, and so what uh, these guys, Kani et al. did in uh, 1999, is they dug into this rock and looked at the iron and looked for, uh, to see if there's any radioactive iron. Um, and they found some. And here's what you expect. Uh, as the rock is forming, it's growing, uh, it's grabbing iron from the water, and you get boring, 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 supernova, boring, boring, boring. That's what you expect to find. Uh, and they indeed found radioactive iron in the rock. Uh, and so let me show you their data. So this is the only plot I'm going to show you. Uh, and so they dug into the rock from the top down, and so the top is the present, and then two, four, six, eight, ten million years ago. And then they look at how much of this crazy radioactivity is there. And if you stare at this plot, the points are their actual data. And there are two things you notice. First, this noisy thing is noise. So those jiggly points are just the noise in their instrument. Uh, for the experts, it's the background to the stable uh, isobar, which is nickel 60. So that's nothing. If that's all they found, that's boring. There's nothing to talk about. That's just noise. But of course, the beautiful thing is that is not all they found. They also found, jump, jumped up here, this beautiful signal. So this means there is this radioactive iron at the bottom of the ocean in this time two to three million years ago. Those are the green bananas. So that's good. Uh, and so that's amazing. You can read off, it's somewhere between two and three million years ago, something put these green bananas, this radioactive iron at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so they found this beautiful pulse. They can tell you when it, when it came from. It's amazing. So that is, that is an amazing result. In the old days, that was like the main result of my talk. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Excellent. And the other thing that you, I don't know how well you can read this, but uh, these guys are amazing. They're measuring the amount of iron, uh, radioactive iron. It's a part in 10 to the 15 of the ordinary iron. So this is an incredibly sensitive experiment, and that's why you needed the big particle accelerator I showed you. Um, okay. So, um, oh, yeah. And I saw a question about the half-life. Um, so, whoops. Uh, uh, sorry. Boo-boo. Uh, um, so, um, Right. So the thing to uh, the thing to appreciate here is the Earth. Remember, the Earth is four and a half billion years old. So uh, so this thing is the million years old sounds like a long time, but that's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. It's point one percent of the age of the Earth. So all of this uh, all of this came very recently. This has not come from the beginning of the Earth. So all right, uh, right. So, so so again. Very cool. So all of, Excellent. all of this was in 1999. Uh, and in just the past few years, this subject became very interesting because there are even more data came up. Uh, so another one of these crazy crusts got measured. Uh, but then other ways of looking for this radioactivity at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so looking at sediments, that's just mud that grows over time. And this grows much faster. And that's kind of good because you get more information from that. It's harder to see. Um, and ask me afterwards, there's even a story about magnetic microfossils, but uh, I'll, just, I'll just move on. The amazing thing is, if the supernova put its debris on the Earth, there should also be debris on the moon, and that has been found. So looking at uh, samples from the Apollo mission that were brought back, uh, they were able to look at them. NASA gave them permission. It's, and that's, that's a big deal because it's a destructive measurement. So several grams of lunar material were destroyed. But in doing this, they found that indeed, there's also this uh, radioactive iron on the moon. Um, and in these cosmic ray particles, it turns out recently it's discovered those also have iron 60. Uh, and, uh, and just recently, uh, the, it was also found in Antarctic snow. Um, so, uh, so we now know there's tons of this stuff all over the place. Oh yeah, and there's also recently been proposed that there's a particular uh, stellar corpse that's flying away uh, that uh, backtracks to one of the places we think the supernova might have come from. So. Uh, so by now, we, these are, this plot shows you a map of the Earth. You see all the places where we've detected uh, iron 60, except it's a little incomplete because now we've also seen it in Antarctica and we've also seen it on the moon. So, the, uh, so we've really seen, uh, we've, we really have a ton of data now. So before, in 1999, this is what the data looked like. That's the plot I already showed you. And now, this is what the data look like. And it's a big mess because I'm trying to show you how much data there is and it's more than you can possibly digest. Um, and so that's really my point. Uh, and so the main thing is everybody agrees that there's a signal two to three million years ago. So there's no doubt something put uh, uh, radioactivity at the bottom of the ocean uh, two to three million years ago. There was a nearby supernova. And in fact, there's a hint that there might even be a second one about seven million years ago. So. Nearby supernova explosions definitely happen. We had one three million years ago. Um, uh, and in fact, once you know that there's a nearby supernova, an important question is, well, how close was it? Um, and it turns out we can actually get a handle on that because as the supernova spreads its debris over space, the further away you go, the more spread out it is and the less that hits you. Uh, and so the measured amount uh, so you, the, there's more dispersion the further away you are. And so the measured amount tells you something about how spread out it was. Uh, and in fact, the number of atoms you expect to find uh, drops as one over the distance squared. It's an inverse square law. Uh, and so that means if you're clever, you can work backwards and from the amount you measure, work out what the distance is. And we've done that, meaning my graduate students did it. And the answer is 60 to 300 light years. And remember the kill distance is about 30 light years, which means the supernova, we don't know exactly how far away it was, it's hard to estimate, but it was near but beyond the kill distance. So it was kind of a near miss. And there, but it was 3 million years ago. So there would have been two-legged critters which saw this. So that's an artist's conception of what they saw. And it was too far away to cause a big extinction, but there's still work on maybe there was some biological damage and people are still actively working on that. So, all right, uh, good. So we're, uh, now we're at the home stretch, but before we go, any burning questions? So here's a few. So 
this was kind of put at the beginning. So when we're talking about cosmic rays, what kind of subatomic or atomic particles are launched? Oh, and then there was yeah, it's a good, excellent question. So uh, so cosmic rays have a uh, have a variety of particles, but they're mostly just very high energy protons. But then they're basically all the other, so protons, of course, are the nucleus of uh, hydrogen atoms, and actually nuclei of other atoms are also there, but in lower abundances. So they're mostly protons, hydrogen nuclei, but they're also the next most abundant thing are helium nuclei. And then after that, there's everything out through iron, and we think even beyond iron, but in, in smaller and smaller abundances. And now we even know they contain iron 60 as well. Um, there also are electrons in cosmic rays, and so those are uh, those are the things that we see. We, we can directly go measure these things um, uh, in spacecraft uh, uh, and even uh, laboratories on Earth. Um, and but and those are and all the cosmic rays that are bathing us now were from supernovae far away. So they're messengers from supernovae which slam into the atmosphere. And one of the things they do, by the way, is they make, for example, carbon fourteen. So if you heard of carbon fourteen, that comes from nuclear reactions due to cosmic rays in the atmosphere. So supernovae are ultimately responsible for that. Okay, great. And we'll just do one more before kind of the, the end. What size of accelerator could quote unquote mimic the magnitude of a supernova if that's even possible? Oh yeah. So, so the accelerators on earth uh, reach impressively high energies, uh, but even then, and, and people at Illinois work on this uh, and take great advantage of that, but supernovae ultimately uh, make, uh, uh, make particles that are higher energy than we can make on earth. And you would need to make, uh, I think, the, the maximum energy of, uh, of, uh, of particles from a supernova is actually still somewhat debated, but uh, you would need to make an accelerator at least the size of the Earth to, to try to compete with what a supernova does, because they are much bigger than the Earth. They, so they, they, they have an advantage that they can take up a lot of space and they've got a lot of energy. Very good. All right. So now, home stretch astro disasters. So we've seen that supernovae can be dangerous and that they do occur near the earth because we see the evidence. We see that, that we had a near miss a few million years ago. So what about the deeper geological past? So, uh, so here we go. So did stars actually attack? And the answer is maybe. Spoiler alert. Okay, so now I'm no paleontologist, but let me just tell you a little bit about the history of biodiversity on earth. So this beautiful plot is a plot that geologists make um, and it shows geological time. And so time runs forward here. So you can see the present, uh, but then uh, we go back 200, 300, 400, 500 million years ago, which still isn't the whole history of the earth, but it's most of the history of interesting life on earth. And then the vertical axis, sorry, it is one other plot, is the amount of biodiversity, it's the number of families uh, of, of critters. So I don't mean like mom and dad, but I mean the, the, you know, taxonomy families. So for example, the dog family includes dogs and wolves and foxes. So that kind of family. And these are marine families. So ocean critters um, over time um, uh, that's seen from the fossil record. And they come in different varieties and that what the colors are. But just look at the top of the line. It shows the total number of families, which it gives you an idea of the diversity, how many different kinds of life there are in the ocean, goes up, generally goes up over time from not too many 500 million years ago to a lot today. But you notice that the overall progress isn't always increasing. Every once in a while, there are these sharp decreases, a particularly big one here at the end of the Permian period, um, and then there's a, there's a recent decrease, a sharp decrease here. And those things are known, so that's where the amount of life went down, those are known as extinction events. And those are in fact are called mass extinction events because they're very dramatic as you can see. Um, and so you're probably familiar with the most recent and actually the least bad, that's when the dinosaurs died. So that's, that was a case of death from above. That's when a, an asteroid or a comet slammed into the earth and that was bad news for T-Rex. Good for our ancestors, bad for T-Rex. Um, but I'm not interested in the dinosaurs. I'm interested in this thing here, which is called the end of the Devonian era here, which uh, as you can see, the, the diversity was going up. It was already going down, but then you see it dra dramatically drops right at the end. And that's what I'm interested in. Um, so this late Devonian period, was an interesting time geologically. And again, I'm no paleontologist, so it won't tell me, take long to tell you what I know. So the earth looked different. The geology, the geography was different because the continents move around and they were almost forming Pangaea. You know, that's what you get when you fit all the puzzle pieces of the continents together that had almost formed, uh, but wasn't, hadn't quite formed 360 million years ago. So this is what it looked like. All the continents were almost together and there's this gigantic ocean. 
Um, and uh, this was the great age of fishes. So this, in this gigantic ocean, that's when fish uh, first really took over the oceans and were plentiful. Uh, on land, uh, oh, and there were also these little critters called uh, trilobites, which kind of looked like horseshoe crabs. Um, and there were the first forests. They were more moss-like than the trees we have now, but the, the, the continents were covered with forests. And there were these things called tetrapods, which just means four-legged creatures. And these tetrapods originally lived in the ocean, but they started to move on to land. And so it was the first time that there were land animals, these four-legged creatures started to move onto land. And we should have great respect for them because those tetrapods are our ancestors. So your great, great, million great grandma, that's her. Um, so they first crawled onto land and we are their descendants. Um, but then over time, there was this thing called a diversity crisis. Sound familiar? Sounds like today, where the number of, uh, uh, there were extinctions going on, but not as many births to make up for them. And so, as you saw, the amount of number of family was going down and down gradually over time. But then, at the, right at the end, there were several impulsive extinctions where a bunch died very, very rapidly. It's the impulsive extinctions I'm interested in. Okay. Oh, yeah, and Mickey's there to remind me, Mickey has four fingers, um, and he's to remind me that these tetrapods, they had different numbers of fingers and toes, but after this in Devonian extinction, only the ones with five, uh, uh, five per, per, per paw survived, and that's why you have five fingers, and that's why we use base 10. Okay, so. I'm interested in the in Devonian because just this past Ju July, during quarantine, this beautiful new paper came out, not ours, but uh, by a group in England. Uh, they were studying spores, fossil spores, plant spores, uh, at, right at the end Devonian, the very last extinction, this dramatic extinction. And what they found is, before the extinction, these fossil spores look per perfectly healthy and nice. After the extinction, they look healthy and nice. But during the extinction, these spores are malformed and they're discolored. And how do they get malformed and discolored? Well, it turns out the way you get spores to do this is uh, you irradiate them with UV light, and the way you irradiate them with UV light is to lose ozone. So this group said what's going on is, for some reason, there was a catastrophic loss of ozone uh, right at the extinction that marked the end of the Devonian period. Um, and furthermore, they looked around, so what would cause a bunch of ozone loss? Well, it's not clear. One thing would be volcanism, but they didn't find any of the chemical signatures of volcanism, so it was not volcanoes. And they had an idea concerning global warming, and it's not that uh, that might have been at play, uh, and that would be important if that's true, but it's not so clear that works either. And so that's where we come in, and this is going to be where I want to end. Um, and so, uh, so what we suggested also during quarantine just this past summer that look there was a bunch of ozone loss right when there was an extinction well could that be a nearby supernova so this is the supernova blast hitting the solar wind and blowing the solar wind back so this is this sort of screaming banshee uh, and a nearby supernova would create an ozone loss just like is observed and it irradiates the earth with these beautiful high energy particles you've been hearing about except now they're not so beautiful once they irradiate very intensely because what would happen? And this is what you would look for. These cosmic rays actually uh, could change the climate. They actually can seed cloud formation. And so that actually could lead to global cooling. So there could be temperature effects, which we could see in the geological record. It turns out the very highest energy cosmic rays also seed lightning strikes. And so there could have actually been global fires. And that also can appear in the geological record. Um, these high energy nasty muons from the cosmic rays that go through us and into the ground and a half mile down, those are bad news for life generally. And they'd be particularly bad for these megafauna, which is these huge creatures that existed at the time because they, their whole body would get irradiated by these things and they'd be particularly at risk. Um, and also supernovae are social. So this is a, uh, 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 the Orion Nebula, where a bunch of massive stars live. If you have one supernova, one massive star, other massive stars are usually born with it. And so if you have one supernova explosion, you often have multiple ones. And so there were multiple extinction events at the end of the Devonian. And, is, and so we expect there, there, there could well be ozone loss and similar signatures in these other uh, 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 extinction events, these punctuated extinctions events. Um, and uh, the other thing, remember green bananas, 
we want to find radioactivity from the supernova. So to go back 360 million years, we can't use iron 60 anymore, but there's a form of plutonium called plutonium 244 that we don't know if supernova make it, but if they do, that would be a great, that would be the absolute smoking gun uh, uh, that, uh, that a supernova is what causes the, the extinction. So, all right. Well, you've been very patient, uh, so let me just finish up. I really only have one conclusion. And my, my, my main conclusion is simply that this is a thing. So this used to be some crazy hobby I did, but now uh, this is a thing. Supernova archeology span is real, and it's a new probe for astronomy, astrophysics, and biology. Um, to, uh, and here, here are all the people that helped me do it. And now I maybe have a little bit more of conclusions. So just to remind you, we have seen live radioactive iron, green bananas, globally and on the moon. Uh, we have signatures from three million years ago, probably also seven million years ago, and we've seen that there's ozone loss. So it tells us there was a nearby supernova recently, and, and we see ozone loss at the end of the Devonian, and that might be the signature of supernova explosions long ago. So this is the birth of supernova archaeology, and what's so fun is it has implications across disciplines, not just astronomy, but also physics, astrobiology, even evolutionary biology. So that's the fun of it. I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression we have nothing else to do. There's lots to do in future research. We'd like to understand better how the supernova gets its material to us, how the supernova make radioactivity. That's the astro stuff I like. Um, there, we'd like to get more in different kinds of radioactivity. There's active interest in that. More on the moon. We'd love to bring back more samples from the moon. There's lots more we can learn from the moon. And this in Devonian, we'd like to find plutonium and some of these other signatures. So stay tuned. There's lots more to learn. And I'll just finish with one more uh, philosophical remark. We already saw from the eclipse uh, that we're citizens of the cosmos and the cosmos intervenes in our lives. Um, and this is the, that's been a theme of my talk that most of the time, the cosmos intervenes in our lives almost imperceptibly, but uh, once in a while, if we're unlucky, uh, the cosmos can intervene in our lives with a vengeance. So on that note, thank you very much. And uh, uh, if, uh, if you need to go, please uh, take off, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, until you run out of patience. All right, great. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> So we have a question by James. How do elements heavier than iron get created? Ah, that is a super great question. And that is still very much a subject of research. Um, and very important for what I was just talking about, because this plutonium is definitely heavier than iron. Um, and so it has to be made exactly in this way. And the, uh, the, uh, the Twitter version is, uh, t as, as we make heavier and heavier elements, we've got to fuse things together, bang nuclei together, and their positive charges repel each other, and this gets harder and harder to do. And so once you get past iron, it becomes incredibly difficult, and a much easier thing to do is to avoid the, the electric repulsion entirely by taking neutrons and just add the electrically neutral neutrons, and then we can build up heavy elements that way. Um, and that is, uh, that is uh, uh, how the heaviest elements are made. But where that happens in nature, what sites uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the cosmos do that is still very much a subject of debate. Supernovae are one candidate, but it turns out another way to do this is to bang two neutron stars together because they're made of neutrons. And, uh, and in fact, we've seen, because we just saw one happen uh, three years ago, and it's clear that at least some of the heavy elements are made that way. And so a very interesting hot topic is uh, how much heavy elements are made, how much of the complement of heavy elements is made in neutron star mergers versus supernova explosions. And our whole, our whole nearby supernova thing fits absolutely into that discussion. It's a great question, thank you. Okay, and then um, George actually um, has uh, his daughter asks a question. Uh, when there was a supernova in the sky a few hundred years ago, how long did it appear in the sky? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, so um, so like I said, every you know every few hundred years, uh, we're lucky enough to see a supernova with the naked eye. It's been uh, uh, it's been you know almost. Uh, it's been 400 years since one has definitely been seen by the naked eye. So when you do see them, uh, the ones that have been seen lasted uh, lasted quite a long time, lasted for months. Um, 
And uh, so typically, you know, you can see it for like a year. It won't be equally bright. The brightest, you know, it'd be quite impressive, but then it, you know, it, 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 it brightens up and then it dims over a period of months. The very brightest one, which is the, in t in the year 1006, uh, we, we saw some pictures of it. That one was bright as it was seen for three years and it was bright enough that uh, at its brightest, it could be seen during the day. Um, so that was really quite, really quite spectacular. All right. So Kyle says there was a recent paper on the measurement of radioactive supernova elements on the moon from NASA's moon rocks that indicate a recent nova on Earth. Thoughts? Question? Yeah. So I think what you what you I think what you're thinking of is is this kind of stuff. So the so what I've been talking about is exactly the the finding radioactivity from a nearby a nearby supernova. Yeah. So um so uh, a nova itself is actually a different kind of beast. It also is a stellar explosion, but it's not as powerful, and it doesn't destroy the star. Um. So yeah. But the 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 radioactive stuff that's been found on the moon is is a, is a, just what we've been talking about. It's from uh it's it's from a nearby supernova. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So isn't, uh, Zach asks, isn't there a star somewhere close by that it's expected to go nova in our lifetime? Oh, uh, yeah. So again, to be, to be technical, they're, they're two, they're two separate kind of beasts. There's, they're nova explosions and super, nova explosions are actually more common. We have dozens of those in our galaxy every year. Um, so, uh, off the top of my head, I do not remember where the nearest nova is. It, it, in general, they're a little closer, uh, but it's still not close enough to be to be a threat or anything. Um, and nova explosions can also be seen, if they're close enough, they can also be seen by the naked eye. And the same Chinese astronomers who told us about guest star supernovae, they also see guest stars that turn out to be novae. So yeah, indeed, those occur all the time. And once in a while, you absolutely can see them with your naked eye. Yeah, okay. All right, so... You know, there are definitely more questions, but it is 1131. Um, how do you feel about taking maybe one more? I'm happy. I'm sure happy to take one more. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's see. So if the atmosphere of the Earth gets damaged, how long would it take for it to be able to naturally fix itself? Or it, what can a it great even do question. that? Oh man, you guys asked the best questions. So, okay, that is a great question. And I, you know, when I was rushing so fast, I didn't say it. Yeah, so uh, the good news is the earth does naturally generate more ozone and we can be grateful for that, um, but it doesn't do it instantaneously. So it takes several years, like, you know, five years, three to five years for the earth to go from no ozone to restoring it. Um, so, uh, and uh, that turns out to be important for our story. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, so for something like a supernova, what that actually means is when the supernova explodes, remember it emits this nasty X-rays and gamma rays, those things wipe off the ozone layer, but then they're gone after a year. The explosion fades, they're gone after a year, and then, you know, life on Earth tries to get back to normal. But then thousands of years later, the supernova blast hits us, and then we get radiated again by these nasty cosmic rays and they don't go away. So it's a double whammy. Uh, so you get a break, but then, you know, you better brace yourself because the worst is yet to come. So again, thank God we don't have to worry about this in 2020. We've got enough to worry about. But yeah, that's, that's such a good question. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. All right. So on behalf of the F Department of Physics, thank you so much for our engaged audience this morning. Uh, really, the success of events like these relies on a great audience and great questions, and there is no shortage of that today. So furthermore, I'd just really like to thank Professor Brian Fields for being so gracious with his time and taking out um, you know, time out of his busy day to present this morning. So the questions that are asked today uh, will be compiled and sent to him. And any of those that may need further explanation, um, we might be able to get posted on our social media. So I hope you all will continue to engage with us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, um, and hope you all have a really great rest of your Saturday and continue to stay well and stay safe. And we'll see you back next time. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much.